All right, good morning, and thanks for uh, being with us. It's been a great morning so far. I know we've come, done kind of a curbside uh, um, Easter brunch and handing out cinnamon rolls, and we do have some cinnamon rolls left over if people like to make it over right after the church, but uh, service this morning. It's always a great opportunity to hear Jesse, too, as he uh, worships and leads us in that this morning. And, and uh, you know, I, my hat's off to him. I, but most of you don't know there's a little bit of background going on behind him uh, there, and that's uh, because of me. Because I'm uh, not overly good at technology. A lot of uh, older people aren't, I guess. And, and uh, so I'm, I'm looking in to see where he's at, and I'm like, where are you? Are you started yet? And then he's texting me back in the middle of that. Yeah, I'm, I'm on. And then uh, I'm saying, make sure it's set on public because I can't see it. And, you know, all of you were already in there tuned on and, and enjoying it. But uh, so even even with uh, some old guy hounding him in the background, he is, uh, you know, he's a focused individual. And I'm, I'm so pleased that we got to be able to listen to him this morning and, and to sing that song for us. Talking about that resurrection life, looking forward to that time when we're resurrected with Christ as well. And... Uh, you know, there's also another resurrected life that we're to be living right now. So it's not all just in the future, it's in the present as well. We're going to be dealing with that in just a little bit. But as we uh, get started in our service here this morning, you know, I, I know that I'm not able to hear you, but I would like to still do what we always do. You know, usually it's at this part of our service when I say, He is risen, and you respond, He is risen indeed. And uh, I can't hear you, but I would like for you to testify, participate this morning in your homes, with your families. Uh, I'm going to say he, he is risen, and I want you to say he is risen indeed. To make that proclamation. So here we go. Good morning, and he is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. That's, a, that's an awesome truth to be able to testify about together here this morning. Well, as we... Uh, begin this service. Let's go ahead, and I know Jesse's already opened us in prayer, but, but I'd like to pray again, and so uh, let's do that now. Our Father, we're so thankful for this day and, and this opportunity to be gathered together here today, and, and Lord, we're thankful for the worship and music as we were able to listen to Jesse and our own hearts singing out uh, with him as well about that resurrection life and that resurrection power that is available to us, and, and Father, we're just grateful. We're so grateful for the love of God that was willing to sacrifice his own son on our behalf so that we can have that resurrected life. Father, we're thankful for Jesus who was willing to come down here and to lay down his life for us to die in our place so that we could experience that resurrection and we could re experience of being reconciled to God. And so Lord, we're thankful for that. And we just pray that you bless us today, Lord, as as we gather together digitally as a church, as we gather together in our homes with our families and, and um, mostly staying a lot separate, but, but trying to find ways to, to encourage one another and trying to find ways to reach out to one another even during this time of, of separation. Father, we do pray for our nation and our world even as we deal with this uh, COVID-19 and, and we pray that... Uh, that people would be protected, that we would see, and we're thankful for the trends lately where we see that it's projected to have much less damage than what it was originally projected uh, to do. And so, Lord, we, we just pray that people would continue to be safe. We pray that you would continue to com comfort families who are experiencing loss. And we just uh, pray for your, your work in this situation. We pray at the same time, Lord, that, that you would have our attention uh, as, as we go through this. And, and that we'd be maybe refocused or renewed in our relationship with you. Maybe some people brought to a relationship with you that have never been in one in the past. And so, Lord, we pray that you would work out your will in this uh, virus as well. Now, Father, we pray for this moment, for this Resurrection Sunday. And truly, the reason we meet every Sunday is because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and to celebrate that. But this one that where we give it even a greater emphasis, where we're focused solely on the resurrection of Christ, we pray that you would bless us in this as we worship you and as we um, recognize what you've accomplished in our life through it. It's in Jesus' name that we pray it. Amen. Amen. 
Well, I want to take our Bibles this morning, and we're going to look at the book of Colossians in chapter 3, where we're going to read the first 17 verses. <clears throat> it says in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 1, If then you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above. Now, now that, that very first phrase, he starts right off with it. He's been talking about it a little bit in chapter 2, but the, the, the rest of chapter 3 hinges on that phrase. If you have been raised with Christ. If you are experiencing that relationship through faith with Jesus Christ, and then the rest of the chapter is, or at least of these 17 verses, is focused on different ways that we live because of that resurrected life that we have in Christ. And he starts off with, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these things, the wrath of God is coming. In these you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on, then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called, in one body to be thankful let the word of christ dwell in you richly teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to god and whatever you do in word or deed do everything in the name of the lord jesus giving thanks to god the father through him you know one thing that's unique about christianity is it's Christianity as a religion is not a, it's not a philosophy. It's not just a list of things that you do and you don't do, and not just a list of wise principles with which you can live out uh, God's will. It does include those, but it's not primarily those. In fact, those are actually secondary. Those are actually the fruit, whereas the root of Christianity is actually in a, a person. And not only within just that person, but it's also centered on an event in that person. Now, obviously, the person is Jesus Christ, but it also focuses on this event. There's an event that happened within history that cleanses us before God, that can make us right with God. And that, of course, is the event of Jesus Christ going to that cross and dying on that cross for us as a sacrifice for our sins, and then his resurrection from the dead. You know, on Friday, on Good Friday, we focused on the cross, and we talked about how Jesus offered himself as a sacrifice for our sins, as both the sacrifice and the high priest. Well, you know, the interesting thing about the high priest is when they offered the sacrifice, how did the people know that the sacrifice was accepted by God? How do they know that it was a good sacrifice? Because there were stipulations on what it had to be. The way that they knew that the sacrifice worked was if the high priest came out of the tabernacle, out of the Holy of Holies, alive. Because if he offered an inappropriate sacrifice, an unacceptable sacrifice, the high priest himself would be put to death. And so if the high priest came out alive, then the sacrifice was acceptable before God. And that's exactly what we see in Jesus Christ. He went into the cross or onto the cross as our sacrifice offering himself as also our high priest. And then, but how do we know that his sacrifice was acceptable before God? Because he came out of that alive. 
He completed the task. That he was the sufficient sacrifice for all of our sins and the sins of the whole world. And that's why the resurrection is such a prominent place within Christianity. It is the central teaching of the apostles. In fact, if we look at the book of Acts, and in the book of Acts is the history book of the early church, the time period where all those other books are being written most fit within the book of Acts. So the book of Acts covers a long time period from right after uh, Jesus Christ ascended back up into heaven, or just as he was ascending back up into heaven, uh, all the way uh, nearly to the end of the Apostle Paul's life. And so when we look at the history book of the, of the early church, we find that the resurrection is the prominent message of the apostles. In Acts chapter 1, in verse 22, the apostles are trying to decide what to do about Judas. Remember, Judas had betrayed Jesus Christ and went out and hung himself afterwards. And so they were down to 11 apostles instead of 12. Now there's a little bit of debate as to whether or not they should have replaced Judas because the Apostle Paul is going to be made an apostle by Christ later. Um, but there's no place that says they're either right in doing that or wrong in doing that. And so, and so it's very possible. There, there's some unique things about the Apostle Paul. So maybe he wasn't the replacement of Judas. Maybe he is just the 13th apostle. But at any rate, the apostles, they're trying to decide what to do about Judas. They see a passage in the Old Testament that says, you know what, somebody else needs to replace him. And so they... They go to pick a new apostle. Now, what are the qualifications? Who who's, can be an apostle? They, these are the qualifications that they use in Acts 1.22. Beginning from the baptism of John. And so in other words, when John the Baptist baptized Jesus way back at the very beginning, before he began his ministry, he says that this person that they were going to pick as, a, as an apostle had to have been with them from all the way back at that baptism of Jesus. Until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these men must become with us and witness to his resurrection. So you notice they say this, uh, to be an apostle, they have to have been an eyewitness of Christ. They have to have been with Christ from the time he was baptized by John before his ministry began to the time that he was taken up onto the cross. So during his whole ministry, they have to have been there. See, the apostles weren't the only ones that hung around Jesus. There were others that hung around as well. And so they picked between these, they narrowed down to two people, and then finally they choose one that would replace them. But notice also, what is the task? They're saying, we're going to pick another apostle for what reason? To be a witness with us to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You see, the apostles were all eyewitnesses of the resurrection of Christ. And so that would be their primary duty, is to testify to the world about the risen Christ. Well, not only that, but if we go on into chapter 2, Peter would talk about the resurrection. And already, instantly, upon the resurrection of Christ, they began to see a lot of predictions of the resurrection back in the Old Testament. Peter would look back to David and talk about David and say, look at David. David said, talked about this Holy One, that God would not allow him to experience corruption and not allow his body to decay in the grave. And Peter's like, that's what this meant. It was talking about the resurrection of Christ. Because David is, we buried David. Well, their ancestors buried David. It was several hundred years before. He says, David died and we buried him. His grave is still with us today. So it can't be talking about David. You know who that's talking about? It's talking about Christ. Because his grave is empty. He's rose again from the dead. And so he's the Holy One that God was, that David was talking about back there, not seeing and not experiencing corruption. And so they instantly recognized that in the Old Testament, it prefigured Christ and it pointed us to Christ's resurrection. Well, also, the resurrection is what got them in trouble. In Acts chapter 2, the religious leaders the Bible says were greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. It was the, the, the teaching of the resurrection specifically that annoyed the religious leaders. And the religious leaders would arrest them, they would beat them, they would imprison them. Eventually, uh, eventually the, the leaders and, and the Roman officials and stuff would put them to death in very torturous ways. But why, why would they do that? 
because of the teaching of the resurrection. They would not stop teaching the resurrection. And God blessed them in that. In verses 33 of the same chapter, it says, And with great power the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. So even though they were threatened with punishment and received punishment, they continued to testify to the truth of the resurrection in Christ. You know, even when you get all the way to the end of the book of Acts and the Apostle Paul is on trial for his life, he makes it very clear within that trial. He says, it is because of the resurrection of the dead that I stand before you today. There was no question in his mind that it all was based upon the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In fact, the Apostle Paul would tell us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 of the prominence of the resurrection in our message. He says, but if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. You see, the Apostle Paul made no bones about it. He says it's all in the resurrection. If Jesus Christ didn't rise from the dead, then you're not going to rise from the dead either. If Jesus Christ didn't rise from the dead, then you're still in your sin. Our preaching is vain. In fact, our preaching is a lie. He said we're being deceptive. And so our preaching is a lie. It's empty. Your faith is empty. Everybody who's died believing in Christ is not in heaven like we say that they are. They're, they're lost forever. And so it is completely empty. All of it hinges on this one thing, the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. But you know what? As we look through the Bible, we find that the Bible has several different ways that it focuses on the resurrection. The one of the ways that it focuses on the resurrection is the surety of Christ's resurrection. I think of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and there's, and there's other places as well, but that's dominant, because he's, he just lists the witnesses. He says, look, I saw Christ alive again. That's the Apostle Paul uh, after he was dead. He says, uh, Peter saw him, James and John saw him, the, the rest of the 11 apostles all saw him alive again after he was dead. He talked about a group that, was over, that consisted of over 500 people all saw Christ alive again after he was dead at, after, um, at the same time. And remember during the time of the apostles writing this, he's, he's telling them, in fact he does tell them, many of, some of those people have died, but most of them are still alive. In other words, you can go ask them for yourself. And so the Bible talks about the resurrection and just the surety. I don't think that there's a historical event that is more verifiable than the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We have so much eyewitness testimony and corroboration and people that had nothing to gain from it and everything to lose. I just really don't think you can find an event in history that you can corroborate as well as you can the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But the Bible also tells us about how that is proof of who Christ is. If Christ can tell you that he's going to be put to death and then raised again from the dead, and then he does it, he is not an ordinary person. He is who he claimed he is. He is the Son of God. In fact, Romans chapter 1 tells us that he is declared to be the Son of God with power through the resurrection of the dead. And so the resurrection is proof of who Christ is. Also, we see that the resurrection is a guarantee of our resurrection. Did you notice in that passage that we read by the Apostle Paul that he had our resurrection and Christ's resurrection just linked together so strongly? He said, look, if there is no resurrection of the dead, talking about our resurrection, he said, then Christ isn't risen either. And if Christ isn't risen, then you're not going to rise either. And in fact, he refers later in the passage to Christ being the first fruits of the resurrection of the dead. The first fruits, in, first fruits implies that there's more to come. The first fruits was an offering that they would offer to God when they take the first part of their harvest 
and offer it back to God, saying, God, we know that there's even so much more to come, and we're just so thankful for it. Well, the Apostle Paul would refer to Christ as a first fruits of those risen from among the dead. In other words, his resurrection is just the beginning. Ours is yet to come. And so his resurrection is a guarantee of our resurrection. But then also, and this is the one I want to focus on the most today, the resurrection life. Because the Bible in many places talks about the, our resurrection experience, uh, our when we believe in Jesus Christ, we experience a new life in him. We talked about it being born again with Nicodemus. We talked about what Jesus offered the woman at the well with the living water in the last couple of weeks. And we experience this new life in Christ. Well, can you imagine going from being dead in your trespasses and sins to alive before God and not having it affect the way you live? Neither can I. Because the Bible, that would be that would be like an oxymoron. For you to go from being dead to being alive and, and think that that's not going to affect your life, not going to change the way you live. And that's exactly what the Bible does. And that's what it does in this passage that we read this morning. And remember what I said, it, the first part is the hinge for the rest of it. If then you have been raised with Christ. And then he begins to explain to them what living that resurrected life would be like. And that's what we want to look at here this morning, is three aspects that we find within this passage of living the resurrected life. Now, the first aspect that we find is that there is a mental aspect to living the resurrected life. Because notice what he says, if then you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. So he's saying, look, there's a new focus to your life. There's a new way for you to think. There's a new... Well, let me just ask you this. What do you think about? What do you find yourself as you're going through, not just sitting in church or, or watching from your living room this morning, but as you go through your day, as you live out your life, what do you find yourself thinking about? Now, all of us are going to have those things that we think about. We think about things that we eat. We think about things that we want to do. We think about our family members and friends, and, and all those things are fine. But if we have experienced the resurrected life of Christ, there should be something else that takes up a dominant place in our thinking. And that is God. That is Christ. When we experience that resurrection life, we have this spiritual life within us now. We're alive. That our minds should go often to God. Our minds should think about spiritual things. We shouldn't spend all of our time thinking about things that are temporal, things of, of entertainment and things of work and, and things of uh, just our earthly relationships. We should also think of things that are spiritual. Our minds should be focused on things that are above and how those things should affect the way that we live down here as he's leading us through in this, in this passage as well. There's a, a new mentality to this resurrected life. And you know what? Sometimes we can get so caught up. In fact, I often wonder in the last few weeks if this isn't part of maybe some of the God's purpose in this coronavirus. Hasn't it all kind of taken all of us and just made us slow down? Hasn't it taken all of us and just kind of make us stop and think? You know, we can get so caught up in the day-to-day and the different functions that are going on and the experiences that we're going through. And we can forget all about God. And we can forget about Him. And the Apostle Paul is saying here, not in this resurrected life, you can't. As you experience this resurrected life in Christ, think about God. Let your, let your thinking about God and your thinking about spiritual things, your thinking about Christ, control everything else that you participate in. It's not that you're not going to think of those other things or do those other things or be involved in those other relationships, but your involvement in those things should be impacted by the resurrection life that you have now. And it will be if you spend a lot of your time thinking about Christ. 
thinking about God's word, thinking about those spiritual things. He tells us to do this many places throughout the New Testament. I think of Romans chapter 8, in verses 5 through 8, he says, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. You know, it's kind of like that old story about the guy that fought the dogs, and he always bet on the right dogs, but they were all his dogs, and somebody asked him, how do you always know which one's going to win? He says, well, the one that I want to win, that's the one I feed. Now, I always think of that when I think of this passage, because it says, what you put your mind on is what's the side that's going to win. If you're thinking about fleshly things all the time, then sin is going to prevail in your life. If you're thinking about spiritual things uh, often or all the time, then God is going to win in your life. The battle is in your mind. Those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. 2 Corinthians 4.18 says, We look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are unseen, or excuse me, the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. In Romans chapter 12, verse 2, it says, Do not be conformed to this world. The word conformed means molded by outward pressures. He says, but rather be transformed. That's a different word. It's a word we get our word metamorphosis from. It's like what the butterfly goes through or, uh, in that cocoon as it's changed from a caterpillar to a butterfly. And you see what that is. That's a change from the inside out. Conformity is a change from the outside being molded from out without. But the uh, transformation is a change from the inside. And he says, but be transformed. Well, how does this happen? This is by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. And so whether we're conformed to this world's image or whether we're transformed into the image of our Creator depends on what? Whether we're renewing our mind, whether we're uh, experiencing this mental aspect of the resurrected life. It also has to do with our spiritual warfare. You know, the Bible tells us we have a spiritual enemy, being Satan and his demons, and we're in a constant battle. Well, this is also the key to how you win that battle. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5, it says, For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. Now he's going to tell you how that works. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. You see where you win that battle, that spiritual battle against Satan and his armies? You win that battle right here. Taking every thought captive, bringing it into obedience to Christ, tearing down every argument that is against God or ungodly, you win that battle in your minds. You see, if we're going to experience this resurrected life, not just in the future, where we're looking forward to it there, but right now in the everyday, it's going to take place right here. There's going to be a mental aspect to this resurrected life. Well, not only is there a mental aspect to this resurrected life, but there's also a moral aspect to this resurrected life as well, because that's what he begins to deal with next. Beginning in verse 5, he says, Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. And then he's going to make a big list. And most of these are they're self-explanatory. Sexual immorality is basically our word fornication. It's any sex outside of the bounds of marriage, the parameters that God gave us for experiencing that gift. Um, impurity, passion. And now, passion, there's, there can be good or bad, but, but if you think of it more in the word lust, that's the idea here. It's inordinate passion. It's passions that are, that are not in line with, uh, with righteousness or with God's will. And then he goes on and talks about covetousness as desiring other people's goods, setting, trying to find our satisfaction in things. Trying to find our satisfaction in things and in experiences rather than finding our satisfaction in God. As he does even provide some of those things and experiences for us. But it's, it's getting our, our look for satisfaction uh, somewhere else other than God. 
But then he also goes down a little bit farther. He talks about anger and wrath and malice and slander and obscene talk. And so there's a lot of different ways, that the things that he deals with. What is he doing? He's showing us that there's a morality to this resurrected life. And this passage, similar to what he does in Ephesians, he tells the people to put off one lifestyle and put on a new one. If you've been raised with Christ, remember it all hinges on that. If you've been raised with Christ, then all those old things, you're dead to those things, those sins that you used to walk in. You're dead to that. But now you need to live a new life in Christ, a very moral life in Christ. Now, lest we get confused, the order is very important. He's saying you have a resurrected life. Now you need to live like it. You see, you will never get a resurrected life by trying to live up to it. He's not telling these people how to become Christians. He's telling them how to behave as a Christian. That's the way it always works in the Bible. Even back into the Old Testament, if you think with me for a moment, just back to when God delivered the nation of Israel out of Egypt through the hand of Moses. What do we see happen? God delivers Israel. He saves them and brings them out into the wilderness. Then he gives them the law. As my people, this is how I want you to live. You see, it always works that way. You can never keep the law in order to become a child of God. You have to become a child of God, and then God tells you how to live in his family. That's the way that it works. You cannot achieve it on your own. It's the same way with, uh, with the woman that was caught in adultery. You remember that? When the religious leaders caught a woman in adultery, and they brought her before Christ, and they're all ready to stone her, and they're trying to get Christ in a tough spot, because they weren't actually allowed to stone her underneath the Roman rule. But they're trying to get Christ in a place where he is kind of a lose-lose situation for him. And he just stops and he writes on the ground for a minute. I would love to know what he wrote. Save that for another time. But he just tells them, let the one of you without sin throw the first stone. And nobody throws a stone. They all turn around and they walk away, starting with the oldest down to the youngest. And they leave just her standing there. And the Bible tells us in John chapter 8, Jesus stood up and said to her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go. And from now on, sin no more. You see what Jesus did with her? First, he forgave her. First, he saved her. Then, he told her, sin no more. You see, uh, that would kind of happen some at the same time because we come to Christ through repenting of our sins and putting our faith in him. But the point is, it's not like you have to clean up your life to come to Christ. It's not like you have to get better. It's not like you can live this set of principles or values or character traits and, be, and in that become a Christian. No, you have to become a Christian. And then God tells you, this is how I want you to live as a Christian, bearing my son's name. Because you're my children. It's kind of like my home. You know, there were things that you could not do, you were not allowed to do in my home. And every once in a while, when I'd get in a squabble with my dad about, well, can I do this or can I do that? And, and, uh, and he would say, no, you can't do that. And I'd say, well, this friend gets to do that, or that friend gets to do that. Dad says, they're not my kid. That's the way God is with us. Sometimes we look at the world and say, well, they, that looks like kind of like fun, what they're doing out there. God says, they're not my kid, you're my kid. This is how you behave in my family. I remember my parents making it very clear that in our family we behave certain ways and we don't behave certain ways. But I was already part of the family. I didn't do that to become part of the family. I did that to show that I was part of the family. And that's what happens with us as well. And, and God, he's already done that with us a little bit in Colossians. If we go back into chapter 2, we say the same thing. It says, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him, through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses. And so you see, he talks about how God has already made us alive in Christ when we put our faith in him. Now we need to live that out. I think of Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6 is very similar to this uh, as well. Romans chapter 6 starts with a question. 
Because he's been talking about the grace of God and how no matter what you've done, you cannot have out sinned the grace of God. Wherever sin abounds, grace of all, uh, superabounds. It abounds all the more. And so he recognizes there will be a question, and he said, some of you will say, well, if that's true, then why not just keep on sinning if grace is going to overcome it anyway? And his answer to them is, how can you do that? His answer is, God forbid. How can we, who are dead to sin, continue to live in it? And then he compares it to their baptism. And he says, look, when you were baptized, you were lowered into the water, and then you were raised back up out of the water. Why did you do that? Because you were picturing Christ's death. Just as Jesus was died and was buried, we are lowered into the water. And just as Christ came out of that tomb alive, we are raised up out of the water. So we're picturing Christ's death and resurrection and we're claiming a union with that. That just as Christ died for me, I'm dying with him. And just as he rose again from the grave for me, I am raised with him. It's a statement of what you believe. It's also a statement of what, how you're going to live. Because he says we are now dead to our sins and raised to a new life. He says, for if we have been in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we who no so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. You see, for those of us, for anyone who's been resurrected by Christ, you, you put your faith in him, and the Bible says you're as good as resurrected right there with him. If you're experiencing that resurrection life, then any sin that you would participate in is a complete contradiction to who you are in Christ. To participate in that death of sin is a contradiction to the life that you have in Christ. So he's saying, how could we live in it? You see, this resurrection life has a moral aspect to it as well. But then lastly, it also has a relational aspect. Right toward the end, as he's dealing with those different uh, morals, we notice a lot of those, like anger, wrath, malice, slander, those are things that we would, if we participate in those, we're actually using those against somebody else. And then when we start up again in verse 12, he says, put on, put on that as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. Notice what he puts on, compassion, hearts, kindness, Humility, meekness, patience. You see, these are all things that involve other people. These are all things that involve relationship. We're not to be angry in our relationships. We're supposed to be loving kindness. We're supposed to be patient with one another. We're supposed to be loving towards one another. In fact, right in between those two lists, we notice in verse 11, he says, Here there is not Greek and Jew. Circumcised and uncircumcised. That was the big division in their culture between the Jews and the Gentiles. And he says, look, here there is, there is no Greek. There is no Jew. There is no circumcised. There is no uncircumcised. There's no barbarian. There's no Scythian. There's no slave. No free. But Christ is all and he is in all. And so what he's doing is he's taking all those ways that the people in their culture were separating one another. You're, you're uncircumcised, I'm circumcised. You're Gentile, I'm Jewish. You're Scythian, you're barbarian, I'm free. You're, and he's saying, look, forget about all that stuff. We're all in Christ. And in Christ, we need to treat each other, not with those divisions, but in unity. We need to treat one another with this loving kindness, with these compassionate hearts. I love verse 13, bearing with one another. That means putting up with. You have to put up with me. I have to put up with you. 
Let me put it a different way. I get to put up with you. That's the way God sees it. And he says, and if you do have a fault against one another, what's the, what's the antidote? What's the answer? Forgive. Forgive just as God has forgiven you. And so the first relationship that we see him dealing with is with one another. He says, look, you need to carry out all these. And I love this. This is why community is so important. And we were talking about that this morning as people were picking up roles. Some of the people were saying, you know what? Being separated like this really makes you feel the importance of community. We want so badly to be back together again. You know, the commands that God gives us within Scripture can't even be carried out without community. There is the assumption of community. You can't exercise loving kindness on yourself. It takes other people. These relationships are so important. And then not only that, but he gives us the last relationship that he focuses on is our relationship with God. Because he talks about singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and have exercising this gratitude out of our heart toward God. What is he describing? He's describing worship. He's describing just what we're doing now. As we're gathered together and we're reading from God's word and we're learning from God's word and we got to listen to Jesse sing at the beginning of it and we're praying together and we're doing everything that we can do to try to be together and do this stuff. We're worshiping. And you know, it always comes down to those two relationships, doesn't it? When God gave us the Ten Commandments, the first four commandments deal with our relationship with God, and they should be first. He's the priority. The last six of the commandments deal with our relationship with one another. Jesus, when Jesus was asked, what's the greatest commandment? He gave them two. He said, the greatest commandment is hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and all your strength. Remember, he's only asked for the first, but he gave him the second. He is like unto it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. It always boils down to those two relationships. So as we celebrate this Easter, we're celebrating a lot of things. We're celebrating uh, that Jesus Christ rose again from the dead. We're celebrating the fact that that confirms to us who he is, that he is the Son of God and God the Son. He is the Savior of the world. We're celebrating, we're celebrating the fact that that means a bright hope and a future for us, that even if we end up in the grave, if we die before he comes back for us and we end up in a grave, our spirit's going to be with him, our soul, our body's in the grave, that one day even that body will overcome corruption, will be raised to be immortal, and we will have an eternity with him where there's no more sorrow or pain. But even now, even now we get to live this resurrected life. That life has a mental aspect to it. It's going to change the way we think. It's going to change what we think about for the majority of the time. It's going to have a moral aspect to it. There's going to be parts of our life that we continue to shed. And that sinfulness, just let it die and fall off like an old snake skin. Let it shed right off again. As we put on, continue to put on that new man in that new resurrected life. And it's going to impact our relationships. It's going to impact our relationships with one another. As we learn how to love one another deeply. And it's going to impact our relationship with God. As we love him with all our might. Our Father, we're thankful for this day. We're thankful for the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, and we're thankful for how closely connected it is with our own resurrection as we put our faith and trust in Him. Thank you for this resurrected life that we can live in Christ. Thank you for this day and the opportunity to celebrate it, uh, doing it together kind of virtually, and then within our smaller family units, I just pray that you bless each home this morning and this afternoon as we continue to celebrate what you've done for us in your son. It's in his name we pray it. Amen.